Hello, my favorite Religion 250 students. I apologize for the video problems last week. Holy cow. Last week was really hard. Uh, so I made the video. I uploaded it on Friday, and then I went to Fish Lake with my son for his 14th birthday. All we wanted to do was go fishing. I'm not a big fisherman, but that's what we wanted to do. And when I got back on Sunday, I checked my computer, and it said that uh, upload cannot be completed, error you know, process aborted. I was like, what? Why? Why? Why would you do that? All right. So, um, so the lecture didn't get out to you till Sunday. I'm really sorry. <clears throat> Hopefully, um, you've had enough time to finish that up. Uh, and of course, let Danica know if there was a problem because it was my fault. So if you didn't get it done by Sunday or Monday or Tuesday or whenever she put the deadline, uh, tell her to go in and, um, and fix your points there. I'm really sorry, really sorry. So this one will be out um, today, which is Tuesday. You'll have to, all day today, all day Wednesday to um, to watch it, and then we should be back on track. Hopefully there'll be no fires. Okay, um, let me share uh, the screen with you. I've got a couple of items before we begin. One um, is don't email Danica or me on Learning Suite. Um, we don't get those emails. Uh, it's 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 just a difficult. It, they haven't perfected the uh, the messages on Learning Suite, and so uh, just email us straight uh, straightforward. Um, Hank Smith at byu.edu or uh, Hank Smith ta2 at gmail.com for Danica, um, because we can't. Um, Basically, what you have to do is they send you a message saying you have a new message on Learning Suite, and then you got to go in, you got to log in, you got to do all that, and then. So it's like, no, I'm not going to do that. Just email me. All right. I think I have a you know, thousand unread messages on there in the last 10 years. Okay. Uh, and also someone asked me about shared study groups. Absolutely. You can do digital study groups with each other. Um, totally fine. The one thing that uh, is on the syllabus that the religion department, um, for some reason, uh, a couple of years ago, created a policy on, and that is uh, doing mass sharing. They don't allow like Google Docs. Um, quizlets that are open to everyone, um, things like that. But yeah, if you create something for you and your study group, totally fine. Um, but just, it's not, it's the mass sharing stuff. Uh, they, it has something to do with copyright and uh, I don't know. So um, you can read that on the syllabus, but uh, okay. Uh, if you have any questions on that, concerns, let me know. All right, let's talk about what we did uh, because last time we were together, because we have an exam and we wanna make sure that you are ready for it. So all the questions on exam one will come off these review slides. Um, so like an easy question is who is known as the father of the covenant people, the house of Israel? And you would say Abraham. Uh, now the covenant of Abraham goes way back to Adam, um, right? But we call it the Abrahamic covenant just because, you know, it's kind of like Melchizedek priesthood. He's just kind of this guy and it was really great, and so we put his name on it, even though Melchizedek priesthood existed before Melchizedek. It was just known as something different. Does that make sense? The Abrahamic covenant existed before Abraham. It just was known as something different. Okay. Um, Isaac, the son of Abraham, and Jacob, the son of Isaac, uh, both received the covenant and uh, passed it on, taught it, and passed it on to their uh, children. Um, the, the three Ps of the Abrahamic covenant are the easiest ones I find it's easy to remember that they'll have posterity, uh, including in theirs, uh, the future Messiah, not in ours, he's obviously come already, uh, priesthood uh, and property, promised lands. Um, so Elder Bednar said, um, D-A-B, do you see that? We were foreordained in the pre-mortal existence and born into mortality to, I'll probably have you finish that statement on the exam, to fulfill the covenant and promise God made to Abraham. That is who we are. That is why we are here today and always. So this Abrahamic covenant is why you came to earth, right? You didn't come to earth. I mean, you did come to get a body and be tested, but it's much more than that, much more than that. Okay. Uh, sometimes we forget why we're here, right? Um, we who are four days in premortal existence, born mortality, to finish 94% of Netflix. If you can do it, right? It's me. Okay, Book of Mormon. Um, oh, all the Isaiah chapters, Jacob chapter five, Christ, second visit the Nephite. They're all about the Abrahamic covenant. But the problem is those are all the parts in the Book of Mormon that most people don't understand. So we're going to make sure we, uh, we get better at those uh, as we talk. 
Um, President Nelson, pretty much the same statement as Elder Bednar, you were sent to earth at this precise time, this most crucial time in history of the world to help gather Israel, right? You know, where the house of Israel comes from, the family of Abraham. There is nothing happening on this earth right now that is more important than that. There's nothing of greater consequence. So uh, in order to understand the gathering of Israel, we first have to understand the history of Israel and the scattering of Israel. So we started out talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You should be able to tell me who those are. When you see the fathers in scripture, that's usually who they're referring to, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? The God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When God appears to Moses, he says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Um, Jacob has 12 sons, right? The most famous of which we talked about was Joseph. Um, and then uh, from Joseph comes, uh, or after Joseph, uh, he's the one that saves the family, right? And then um, that's the end of the book of Genesis. Then Exodus opens with the children of Israel being in Egypt still, but they're in slavery to the Egyptians. So Moses comes, right? Let my people go. Um, and they leave, they cross the Red Sea, and the Lord renews the covenant in Exodus chapter 19. If you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, you will be a peculiar treasure. So the covenant is back on for the house of Israel. God is forgiving and kind, and he gives them what's called the law of Moses. Uh, the law of Moses begins as a total 613 laws. By the time the Savior comes, there's going to be thousands more. But it begins with 613 laws. Um, part of it was animal sacrifice, but it's not the only part. There was faith, repentance, baptism, remission of sins, the Ten Commandments. Uh, eye for an eye was given as restitution, not revenge, initially. Um, and the whole center of the law of Moses, the whole center of the king of the the house of Israel, the tribes of Israel, was the tabernacle at the center. Um, it was where they went to, to pray, to offer sacrificial offerings. Uh, we talked about the high priest and his clothes, right, represents Jehovah. So God is in their midst, right? Uh, he has them on the breastplate, the shoulders, right? The tabernacle had three separate areas. Um, the courtyard, the holy place, and the holy of holies. I think I have a picture of that right there. So you have the outer, the courtyard right there, which is where all those tables are. And then inside the tent, uh, which is the ac actual tabernacle, you have uh, the holy place in the, the first room that you would come to from the laver, from the brazen laver, that's the holy place. And then in the back room, one and two, that's the holy of holies. Okay. Um, let's see. Where was I? Oh, okay. Uh, and Yom Kippur, this is the biggest day for Israel in, uh, of the year, the biggest day of the year for Israel. And it's at the tabernacle. It's called the day of atonement, Yom Kippur. Uh, it's commemorating the day Moses came down after they off the, out the mount, out of the mountain, off the mountain, since they'd worshipped the golden calf, and tells them they've been forgiven of their sins. Um, so the high priest, representing Jehovah, is alone in the tabernacle. Um, he, this is the one day he's going to take all that extra, you know, fancy garb off, and he's going to be dressed in white, just like every other priest, just in a simple white robe. Um, he's going to wash his hands and his feet. Um, he's going to pray at the altar of incense. We talked about him with his hands up, praying in front of the veil, asking God to hear his voice um, and show mercy upon us. This is the day that if he, he comes out of the temple alive, then God has forgiven their sins again every year. He's going to forgive their sins, right? And then he has the two goats, right? We talked about one of them. He has the blood he, he takes and uh, sacrifices, and he has the blood, and he takes it into the um, he takes it into the Holy of Holies and sprinkles that blood on the, on the Ark of the Covenant. Um, and the other goat representing Israel's sins is sent out to the wilderness, right? And they've like, never seen again. So not only are they forgiven of their sins, but they need to forsake their sins. Okay, so I'll probably ask you on the exam, like, um, what was the center for uh, of of Israel during the time of Moses, right? And then you'd say that tabernacle, right? That was the center. That was the holy place. Um, I might ask you what Yom Kippur is. Uh, I might ask you, um, um, I don't know, you guys. Um, I'll just ask you some of the basics, right? Like true or false. Baptism was part of the law of Moses. It's true. Um, 
according to Elder Bednar and President Nelson, why are we here? Why did we come to earth, right? And I'm looking for these two quotes. Um, thinking of questions as we go here. Uh, when I read about the fathers in the Old Testament, who should I think of, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay. Um, yeah, I think just, if you can teach this slide to somebody else, you got it. Um, that, then you'll, you'll be, you're on the right track, okay? All right, I feel good. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, I can take questions and either put them in the lecture. If you send me a question, you say, hey, Brother Smith, could you answer this in the lecture? Or I can answer it at the Q&A um, if you can't make it to the Q&A. Okay. Now, interestingly, people have asked me before, well, where does this fit in with like the new and everlasting covenant or the oath and covenant of the priesthood? They're the same thing. Now, some people might say, well, they're a little bit, you know, different in some details. Yeah. Sure, but they're pretty much the same thing. Um, look, I mean, it's, Section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants is the oath and covenant of the priesthood. Does this sound like the Abraham and Covenant? Those who are faithful unto those two priesthoods which I have spoken, magnifying their calling, are sanctified by the Spirit and the renewing of their bodies. They become the sons of Moses and of Aaron and the seed of Abraham and the church and the kingdom of the elect of God. They who receive me, receive the priesthood, receive me, saith the Lord, for he that receiveth his servants, receiveth me, and he that receiveth me, receiveth my father, and he that receiveth my father, receiveth my father's kingdom. All that my father hath shall be given unto him. It's the same promises, it's the same duties and promises of the Abrahamic covenant. We just call it in this one, the oath and covenant of the priesthood. Um, when they do an everlasting covenant, same idea. In the celestial glory, there are three heavens or degrees, and in order to obtain the highest, a man, a woman must enter into this order of the priesthood, meaning the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. If he cannot, he cannot obtain it. Well, that, that's pretty obvious. If they're offering them posterity, right, that God wants them married um, and uh, married by, you know, the right priesthood authority. So it's the, again, it's the same thing, maybe different, maybe different aspects of the covenant, but it's still the same covenant that was basically promised to Adam all the way up through, through us. Uh, do what I ask you to do. Be faithful, receive me, make me the center of your world, right? Keep the commandments and you'll receive all that my father has, um, more than the sands of the sea, right? It's, uh, it, it's uh, we get a little too complicated when we start saying, okay, what's the difference in the covenants? I don't think the Lord, uh, I don't think the Lord cares that much as, you know, because they're pretty much all the same idea. We just call them different things. Okay, um, we talked about the movement from the, you know, the three rooms and how it becomes more holy as we go. Uh, I think I found some of the pictures I was looking for last time. Um, so there he is, he's at the altar of incense. He's got the, uh, the ashes that are burning from the fire in one hand. Uh, he'd, he'd take a little shovel and he would, he would hold the shovel like this and he'd have the little shovel. Uh, and then the cup in the other hand where he's got the blood. Uh, from the goat. Um, here he is walking uh, up from the uh, outer courtyard and he's going to go into the temple all by himself. Uh, and there he is uh, at the veil, right? And he's got the, the cup in his hand and he's got the, the shovel in the other with the ashes. Um, so just some other pictures from Yom Kippur I was looking for. Uh, and hopefully this helps those of you who've been endowed, hopefully all these, um, you know, what if you just look at him, he, his clothes, his hands, everything looks very familiar. Okay, uh, let's talk about the Passover. The Passover is the second most sacred day for Israel. So what is it for you and I? What's our, what's our most sacred holiday? Uh, probably Christmas. Or it used to be sacred. Christmas and then Easter, right? So that's kind of like what this is. This is kind of Christmas and Easter. Yom Kippur and Passover, two different days. Uh, Yom Kippur is the most sacred, Passover is the second most sacred. The feast of the Passover was instituted to commemorate the passing over of the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when God smote the firstborn of the Egyptians and more generally the redemption from Egypt. So uh, if you don't know what this is, uh, when Moses left Egypt, uh, there was 10 plagues. He was trying to get the children of Israel out of Egypt and Pharaoh wouldn't let them go. And each plague took down an Egyptian god. I think I talked about this last time until finally the last Plague comes and destroys Pharaoh himself, and then they they leave, right? Um, so that night when Pharaoh's son was killed, uh, there came a destroying angel, they said. But he 
Moses told the children of Israel, if they will put the blood of a lamb over their door, right? Just wipe it on their door and the side post of the door and the top, then the destroying angel will pass over their house. Um, so a male lamb of the first year without blemish was chosen for each of the family in Israel. It was slain by the whole congregation. So, uh, so when it comes to the time of the Passover, if, uh, if my dad is still alive, um, then we all go to his house and we all walk up to the temple together and we have this lamb and um, it spent some day, a few days with us. So we kind of become attached to it. And it's supposed to be this way. It's supposed to be difficult. It's supposed to be a sacrifice. The whole family takes it up there and uh, the priest will kill it, right? Very quickly. It's not a torturous thing. The priest will, the priest will kill it and will take its blood and put it on the lintel. That's the top of the door and the two side posts of the doors of the house. Uh, and part of it is going to be used. We'll talk about this more when we get to the Savior's Last Supper. Uh, but this is an important day in Israel. And it's one that we need to understand and know about in order to understand the Savior's life. Okay. They wander in the wilderness for 40 years. I think we talked about them not going into the promised land because of Joshua and Caleb. Oh man, you guys, I can't remember if we talked about this. All right. So let's talk about it. So Moses leads the children of Israel out of Egypt and they go straight to the promised land. I remember talking about this. Didn't we talk about this? Uh, and the, the Moses sends in 12 spies and two of them come out and say, let's go forward and do this. Their name's Joshua and Caleb. Let's go in and fight. That's our property. God will give it to us. And 10 of them say the people are too great. They're giants. We're grasshoppers. It's a bad deal. And uh, Moses asks the children of Israel what they want to do. And they listen to the 10 instead of the two. The two were Joshua and Caleb. Uh, and so the Lord, they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. We talked about that we say 40 in the scriptures uh, in the Bible can be translated as 40, meaning the number 40, or it can be many, right? So they wander in the wilderness for many years until um, the Lord takes Moses out of their midst, right? He gets to see the promised land, but he never gets to enter, poor guy. Uh, and then uh, the Lord puts Joshua in his place. And that's the beginning of Joshua, basically the book of Joshua after the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those are called the five books of Moses. And the next book in the Bible is Joshua. And Joshua takes the place of Moses. Can you imagine taking the place of Moses? <laughs> That'd be miserable. Um, and most of you know the story of Joshua and the battle of Jericho, right? Where they cross the Jordan River and the first city they get to is Jericho. It's still there, by the way, the city of Jericho, just on the other side of the Jordan River. And um, they go, uh, they enter the city and pretty soon they conquer the land of Israel um, from the Canaanites. Those are the people who live in Canaan. That's the original name of the land. We call it the promised land or Israel, but the original name was Canaan. All right. So Israel is once again established in, um, uh, in the promised land. Uh, here are the different tribes who receive different lands. It's a beautiful piece of property. You can see Judah is a massive kingdom. Um, uh, the Sea of Galilee, you can see the Dead Sea down at the bottom. That river that goes up, well, actually, it comes down, but that line that goes up is the river <clears throat> called the Jordan River, uh, and that is the, the sea above it is called the Sea of Galilee. That looks kind of like a harp or like, what else is it? I can't tell. All right. Um, so this is going to be good, right? God keeps his promises. Um, they came back. They, they delivered us to the promised land. He gave them Moses and now Joshua, and they are delivered to the promised land, right? If you're obedient, God will keep his promise. So what do they have to do? They just have to keep being obedient. That's all they have to do is keep being obedient and God will continue to keep his promise to them. Great, right? Not that hard, right? Oh, it's the same thing with us, isn't it? All you got to do is be obedient. All you got to do is make good choices. Uh, and, you know, you're not going to have a perfect life, but you're going to have, God's going to bless you. There's going to be blessings built into being obedient. You're going to be set, right? Oh. Well, what happens? Well, over time, there's a series of judges uh, that come after Joshua. And it starts out okay. Um, I like this picture. Uh, look on the left-hand side. It starts with Joshua. Obey the commandments of the Torah. The Torah is the five books of Moses, right? The promised land. Here we go. It's going to be great. Uh, so they have a series of judges. Look at the pretty good line. Do you see that? Um, I like that. The pretty good line with Ehud and Deborah. Uh, then, okay, Gideon, right? Gideon, the sword of the Lord, and of Gideon. And they're trying to be obedient. 
Uh, and then it gets worse and worse. And then it bad, it gets really bad with Samson. Um, and it was, it, it, by the end of the book of Judges, things are not good, right? Uh, so, of course, God is sending prophets. This is what he does whenever, you know, when people are not doing the right thing, God sends prophets to warn the people. And who does he send in this case? He sends Samuel, who is the son of Hannah. If you don't know this story, it's a, it's a fantastic story where Hannah goes to the temple one morning. Uh, she goes to the tabernacle. There's no temple yet. There's going to be soon. Uh, she goes to the tabernacle and she prays um, for a son. She's barren and she has no, no, she has no children. Um, and for this, this is a, not only a, this is not only a trial just because you can't have children, but it's also a social kind of death sentence. Um, people will feel terrible for you and your husband. And it's just like, you're cursed by God. What's going on? So she goes to the temple to pray. And that guy on the left looking at her, his name is Eli and he's the high priest, right? They don't have him in his garb like he should be, but couldn't find a picture with him in his high priest clothes. Okay. So she's praying for a son. Eli comes over and he says, you shouldn't drink this early in the morning. She's like, I'm not drunk. I'm praying. And he's like, sorry. <clears throat> and so uh, he says, what are you praying for? And she says, I'm praying for a child. And he says, you will have a child uh, and he'll be great in this, you know, uh, in the side of Israel. Uh, and that's uh, a few years later, you can see the picture on the right. Hannah comes to present her son, Samuel to Eli. There he is in his high priestly garb. I don't know why he's sitting on some sort of throne, but uh, she comes and presents um, him and basically he says, uh, I give him to God. Uh, he can basically work here in the temple and he can be the Lord's. The Lord gave him to me um, and other children and I want to I wanna give him back. So uh, it's a, the story of Hannah is incredible. It's going to come back up when we talk about Mary, the mother of Jesus, because she's a big fan of Hannah, apparently. Um, so it's, it's, it's an absolutely beautiful story. Well, uh, Samuel grows up. You guys know the story where Samuel, you probably have heard this story where Samuel's in bed and uh, the Lord says, Samuel, Samuel, he gets up. He thinks it's Eli who's calling him. And he goes to Eli's room and he's like, what did you want? Eli's like, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. So he goes back to bed. Samuel, Samuel, he goes back to Eli's room. Eli's like, I didn't call you. You know, the kind of back and forth. You probably heard this story. Uh, and then um, basically what happens is Samuel is called as the prophet in Israel. Eli hasn't been doing so well with the kids. Um, his sons are terrible terrible. They make terrible choices. I shouldn't say they're terrible people, but they make terrible, terrible choices. And Samuel is now the prophet. And what happens is uh, the children of Israel, if we go back here, the children of Israel uh, are surrounded by countries who have kings. And they go to the prophet Samuel when he's older, and they say, Samuel, we want a king. And Samuel goes to the Lord and says, they want a king. And the Lord says, this, this is a terrible idea. And he lists off all the reasons why. And he basically says, I, I want you to be different. That was the whole point, right? You'll be a peculiar treasure to me. You'll be different. I, I want you to be different. Um, we're going to do things differently than other countries do, but they're tired of being different. They, they want to fit in. They want to be more like everybody else, right? Do you remember going through this phase of life? Did you ever go through a phase of life where you're tired of being different and you're you just want to fit in with the rest of the world, right? Um, and so uh, <laughs> the Lord basically says, well, you know, I think it's a terrible idea, but if this is what the people want, right? He, he, lets, he gives them their agency. So uh, who is the first king of Israel? His name is Saul. Um, on the picture on the left, this is Samuel going to Saul and saying, uh, you are chosen as the first king of Israel. And Saul's amazing. He says, who am I? Who am I? I'm a nobody from a nobody family in a nobody tribe. He's from Benjamin. He says, my family is the least of the tribes of Benjamin. Like I'm a nobody. And Saul says, that's why you'll make a good king because you believe you're a nobody. Uh, and by the end, picture on the right, what happens? Saul is a raving lunatic. Uh, he is so power hungry. Um, he is so worried about people trying to take his throne. He's worried about what people think of him more than he's worried about God. Uh, and what did God say about um about kings? Yeah, they're a bad idea. Maybe we should go back and try it the Lord's way. Nope, let's get a new king. So who do they choose next? His name is David. David uh, is the one who killed Goliath as a boy, right? This cannot go wrong. This guy's amazing. So uh, Samuel says, you are the new king of Israel. And what happens to David? 
yeah, he turns into an adulterating murderer. Uh, the picture on the right is when the, what the prophet Nathan comes to David and says, what did you do, right, with Bathsheba and Uriah? What did you do? What did you do? And David's ashamed, and uh, he's like, and he takes the throne from him, uh, and it's passed on to Solomon, right? This is going to go great. Solomon is so wise. He's known for his wisdom, and he builds the people a temple. Temple on the left is the temple, of Solomon's temple, Temple of Solomon. It's still going to be there uh, somewhat when Jesus comes. I'll, we'll talk about that. But this begins what's called the first temple period, uh, because now we don't have the tabernacle. We have an actual temple, an actual structure building that Samuel builds the people. Uh, but Samuel has a, um, a weakness. Look at that picture on the right. I can't, I don't know if you can tell, uh, Samuel has a certain weakness and that is, um, he loves to be loved. Uh, and so he gets 700 wives, not seven, 70, 700 wives uh, and 300 concubines, which are basically just girlfriends. Uh, and uh, his, his life is so, it, it's, it's just a mess. His life is a mess because a lot of these women are not Israelite um, and they want other gods set up, right? They're gods. Um, set up. And so he's, he's, Solomon starts setting up other gods. So there's a lot more to this, but we've got to go quick here. Solomon starts setting up other gods in Israel. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrible thing. And, um, and Solomon's answer for pretty much everything is just tax the people more. Um, so whenever there's a problem, he's like, well, just tax them more and pay for it, right? Just tax them more, right? You'd be like, Solomon, I have a problem. He's like, ah, Here's some money. Go throw it at it, right? It's his, that's his answer for everything. Well, what happens when you tax people too much? Yeah, there's a point where people are done being taxed, and that's what happens. After Solomon, the kingdom is broken. It's called the divided kingdom now. Israel divides into Israel, the northern tribes, the ten tribes of Israel, even though they really don't have tribes after this, uh, and Judah in the south with two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. So now they've broken in half. Um, and this is terrible, right? Because remember back with Joshua, all you can do is keep the commandments, you'll prosper here, and it's not going well. Uh, so now there's two kingdoms, Israel in the north and Judah in the south, and they both have different kings. This is one of my favorite pictures, or one of my favorite, I found this the other day. I love this. Okay, um, so this person listed off the, king, the kings of Israel and now the kings of Judah, because now you have two kingdoms, you can have two kings. So the first one's Rehoboam and Jeroboam, um, and look, he just lists them all. Disobedient, disobedient, disobedient. That's the kingdoms on the north. Disobedient, disobedient. So which ones do you think is going to be destroyed first, Israel or Judah? Yeah, look, at disobedient, disobedient, disobedient. And then my favorite was down here, the kings of Judah. Disobedient, disobedient, obedient, obedient, disobedient, obedient, murderer, <laughs> obedient, obedient, obedient. Hey, we got a Ford, Ford, you know, uh, a turkey there of obedience. Uh, and then I love this one with Ahaz, particularly horrible, <laughs> completely faithful, Hezekiah. He is a great guy. Um, Manasseh, particularly horrible, disobedient, very faithful, disobedient, disobedient, disobedient. So you can kind of see that the, how the kings are going to go um, from, from <laughs> this point on. And the Lord continues to send, he continues to send prophets to both the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah, um, trying to get like Elijah and Elisha. These are all during this time period where he is calling on these people to repent, to come back together, to be ruled instead of not by kings, but by uh, prophets and by God, by the law of Moses, right? And uh, they don't want it. Um, but some of these kings of Judah, they're, they're okay, right? They're, they, they do okay. And we'll talk about those. Um, so here's basically how it goes from, from the divided kingdom on out. Uh, you have... Uh, well, let's put these side by side so you can kind of see how they go. So you have the kings of Israel, that's the kingdom in the north. You have the kings of Judah, that's the kingdom in the south. And I know you're like, Brother Smith, why does this matter? It's a class about Jesus. But we've got to have a little background here or else we're going to get to Jesus's time and have no idea why the things are the way they are, um, why people act the way they act, right? And so then we're just going to be a bunch of ignorant people talking about things we don't understand. Um, and so it's like, we don't want to be a gospel doctrine class. Okay, so let's, sorry, that shouldn't have been out loud. Okay, let's talk here. So we have our first two kings of, um, one of Israel, Jeroboam, and the king of Judah is Rehoboam. It keeps going 
uh, like this, uh, and you've got uh, this guy Asa or Asa, depends on however you say it, I don't care, um, who lasts a long time. He is one of the kings of Judah who lasts like 40 years as the king of Judah. Um, then you have a guy named Jehoshaphat, who's a pretty good guy, very faithful. And on the other side, you have Ahab, who is uh, really, he's the one that marries Jezebel. It's just a terrible situation. Um, then you can see that just king after king after king, uh, eventually um, the king the, I want you to really notice is the king on the bottom right. His name is Hezekiah. All right. During the reign of Hezekiah, or just before it, during the king, reign of King Ahaz, comes a particularly important prophet. His name is Isaiah. Isaiah comes around 740 BC. So you see, uh, do you see that Ahaz is right at the end of his reign when, um, or sorry, right at the beginning of his reign when Isaiah shows up? Um, and so Isaiah is going to start speaking to Ahaz uh, and then to Hezekiah. And that's uh, a particularly important story that we'll talk about that we'll talk about next time. Um, but as you read Isaiah, um, I think that's what's coming up, right? As you're reading Isaiah, I want you to do three things for me. Uh, I want you to look at three layers because it's important that we understand all three layers. The very first part of Isaiah we need to understand is his own time and place. So if you understand these two areas, these two um, kingdoms, you'll understand Isaiah's prophesying a little bit better because what's happening is he is going to Ahaz, who is the king of Judah, and he's talking to him about Pekah, who is the king of Israel. And this is the time where Judah and Israel are kind of warring against each other. And so if you can kind of understand that, you'll see, you'll read Isaiah and go, oh, I kind of understand what he's talking about here uh, because you've got to know the history. You've got to know these, who these kings are because he's talking about his own time and place. Second layer on Isaiah is a very Christian layer, uh, which is more eisegetical, right? Exegesis would be studying Isaiah in his particular time and place, what he meant. Now, eisegetical would be, let's add a Christian layer onto this and look for the, the Savior in the chapters of Isaiah. And then let's add a third layer, which would be basically a Latter-day Saint layer where we're looking at um, millennium and resurrection, uh, that type of idea in Isaiah. So there's, there's basically three, three layers I want you to see. But that first layer is important. Understanding Isaiah in his time and place, in his context, is absolutely crucial. So that's what we're going to be after here for the, for the next couple of days. So don't get too frustrated. I'll make sure that you understand it. Um, don't, don't get angry, you know, like, oh, why can't I understand this stuff? Um, uh, you will. You will. It's, it's helpful. And I'll, I'll, I'll even give you a place where you can go and you can get more extra if you want. If you're like, Brother Smith, I really want to understand Isaiah. Um, you know, we can do this, this layering thing with the rest of the Bible. For example, um, if you're a Christian and you study the story of Noah and the ark, right? Um, it, could it be literal? Sure. It could be a literal story. Could the Lord flood the earth? Sure. He can, he can do whatever he wants. He's God. Um, but I, I have a tendency to read these things more figurative. So when I read this story, I, I try to learn from it, right? Uh, but I also look at baptism because that seems to be, when you put that Christian layer on top of the earth being completely submerged in water, you're going, okay, the earth had to be cleansed before it could receive the Abrahamic covenant, right? Um, I like that idea. I like that idea. I, I, now again, could it be literal? Sure. It could hundred percent be literal. You guys, I, I, I do not want to be the person who's like, Oh, come on. That can't be literal. I, I I'm not going to pretend that, that I understand things that God, you know, God's in Isaiah 55, it says, my ways are not what your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. I think he means I'm smart and you're not. Uh, so I'm not going to go there and go, well, I don't think it's scientifically possible. I don't, you know, if God can, God create the earth, he can do whatever he wants. But I try to read it and say, okay, what may be the figurative meaning in this? Same with the serpent on the staff, right? I think we've talked about this one. The serpent on the staff would be representative of the Savior. If you, if you, you know, look to him and live, 
um, we would see the Savior in that, in that story. Again, this is very eisegetical. You're putting a Christian layer on this, but um, I, I like it. What about Jonah and the whale? Could God put a man inside a whale for three days? Sure, he can do whatever he wants. Um, but I see the Savior in the tomb, right, for three days. Jonah comes out of a place he should never have come out of, um, and yet he did. And here you've got the Savior in the tomb. One story I wanted to look at in particular that a lot of people don't understand or know is the story of Abigail. This was during the reign of King David. Um, and Abigail uh, is the wife of a guy named Nabal. So what happens is that David, um, David has been nice to her husband, Abigail's husband, Nabal. And um, he's been, he's king, so he can do whatever he wants. But at one point, uh, he is just trying to be, you know, he's trying to be a good king and trying to be nice to Nabal. Nabal's super rich. He's got a lot of uh, land and property. Um, and so David kind of lets him do his thing, doesn't, you know, overstep his bounds. Well, there comes a point where there's a, a bit of a problem for Israel. They're under, in war and, and David needs Nabal's help. Uh, with land and food and things. And so he sends word to Nabal that he basically wants to use his land for the army. And Nabal writes back to David, says he um, he railed on him. That's the actual term in the scriptures. <laughs> he railed on him. And um, David's ticked, right? Because Nabal basically says, who's David that I should serve him? I don't care about him. And And so David is ticked off. And so he... Um, he comes back and he's to his army and he says, we're going to go destroy Nabal. Okay. So Nabal's wife is this girl, Abigail, and she hears that her husband is an idiot and basically has insulted the king. And if you're an enemy, if you're not a friend to the king, you're the king's enemy. And if you're the king's enemy, he's going to come kill you. So she, hearing that her husband has been so stupid, goes running out um, goes running out to, to meet him. I'm trying to, I'm trying to look at, ah, I can't find it. I was trying to find a, a reference there. Okay. So she goes running out to meet David. Okay. And she brings a cart full of gifts and everything. And she comes and throws herself down in front of David. And she says, upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be upon me. Listen to this statement upon me, my Lord, upon me. First Samuel 25. Um, let's see. Uh, verse 18, first Samuel 25, 18. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of two bottles of wine, five sheep ready and dressed five measures of parched corn. She gave, brings all these gifts out. Um, and she runs in front of David. Uh, she throws herself down on on her face, bowed herself to the ground and fell at his feet and said, upon me, my Lord, upon me, this is verse 24, let this iniquity be and let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thy handmaid. Um, and so she basically says, uh, please forgive me for, for what I've done to you because I'm taking on his sin. I'm taking on Nabal's sin. Look at verse 28. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thy handmaid. Um, and we will help you as much as you want. Okay. So, um, and David, David does, he forgives her. And he says in verse 32, blessed be the God of Israel who has sent thee, sent thee this day to meet me. Um, so Abigail, knowing that Nabal has committed a terrible sin, basically sin, faux pas, has offended the king, runs out and makes intercession. Um, basically says, Please blame me. Let me take on this sin and uh, please uh, forgive me. So Abigail to me uh, is someone we need to talk about more because she is this beautiful Christ figure, right? I do something stupid and here comes the law of justice and it's going to come and it's going to wreak havoc on my life, right? The law of justice is every sin should be paid for. Here it comes. Uh, and I'm dead in the water. I got nothing. Uh, the Savior is going to talk about this with wolf and sheep, right? When the sheep is out there and the wolf's coming, what are you going to do, right? Man, I am nothing. You're, you're dead. 
um, and you're just standing there. So I'm Nabal and I've done so, you know, I've committed stupid sins. I've made mistakes and here comes the law of justice and it's going to come take me away. And here comes this person who throws himself or herself in this case in front of the law of justice and says, punish me instead. Um, it's a beautiful story uh, of, 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 of an intercession. And I hope you can see the savior there that, that as you have done, have you made mistakes and you've sinned and here comes the law of justice uh, that here it comes for you and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, and the savior steps between you and the law of justice and says, upon me, let this iniquity be. Don't hurt them. It's okay. Hurt me instead. Oh, it's beautiful stuff. Okay. Uh, hopefully, um, you found all this helpful today. Um, let's see, let's make sure I covered everything that I wanted to cover. I did. Okay. So, uh, we will, we will review next time. Um, we will go, let's talk Isaiah next time that we're here. Uh, let's talk Isaiah and then we'll take from Isaiah through, uh, we need to go from Isaiah all the way up to the Roman empire conquering and the savior being born. So that's going to be a lot for next time. So uh, just be prepared and keep doing your reading and let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns, email Danica with anything uh, and know that we love you and we want you to have a good experience. So please let us know what we can do. Uh, I know this isn't the most ideal thing, but Hey, we're going to make it work. Uh, we got to move forward. And you know, I think, I think this is a good lesson. Like when things aren't ideal, we, we still move forward and uh, we're going to be successful. We're going to thrive. All right. Okay, see you my friend.